Good day, PSSE2, and welcome to our third online sync for World History 2. Um, before we proceed to our lesson, may I remind everybody that your uh, module submission or the output from the module 4 and 5 um, is extended until next week, March 1st week. So, still have um, a lot of time to submit, okay? Um, again, on Monday, and Tuesday is uh, our continuation of the online sync. So just um, wait for the link um, in your in our chat groups. I'll be posting the link there, and then um, we'll see on ourselves on Monday and Tuesday. Okay. All right. Now to begin with our lesson for today, let me present my slide for World History Two. And let's start. Okay, so our lesson is all about the emergence of mass society, nation state, and Western imperialism. So last time we talked about the emergence of industrial revolution. So that was a time where Europe transformed from feudal state to an industrial state, where a lot of things happened that improved the economic life of the, the European European um, nations, specifically in England, France, Germany, and other nations in Europe, okay? So now let's talk about how um, the emergence of mass society and the birth of nation state came in, um, in, in Europe, and we'll have to talk also about Western imperialism, about colonialism, okay? Okay. All right, so the emergence of mass society. Uh, let's talk about its population growth. Now, the European population increased dramatically between 1850 and 1910, rising from 270 million to over 460 million by 1910. All right, can you imagine? Uh, the, the main factor here is um, medical discoveries and environmental conditions, but we'll talk about that later, all right? Now, between 1850 to 1800 or 1880, the main cause of the population increase was the rising birth rate. Um, well, there's a least in Western Europe, but in other European countries, uh, they have this noticeable increase of the population due to um, higher birth rate. But in 1880, there was also a, a decline um, in death rate rates, which largely explains the increase of population. Again, these are the causes why um, a, a dramatic change of the population came about. It's because of the advancement of technology, especially in the medical field and environmental conditions. Now, um, some historians have stressed the importance of developments in medical science, especially when, um, when the Europeans discovered uh, penicillin, antibiotics, and also they were able to, dis to discover pasteurization uh, that led and helped um, many societies in Europe to have achieved greater um, life expectancies of babies because milk then were able to pasteurize, and that kills at least 99% of bacteria coming from the cattle's milk, right? So these are um, some of the, the discoveries in this time that causes a surge of population increase during the, um, in the, in the height of industrial revolution in Europe, okay? All right, next we have the transformation of urban environment. Now, one of the most important consequences of industrialization and the population explosion of the 19th century was urbanization. In the course of the 19th century, urban dwellers came to make up an ever-increasing percentage of European population. Well then, we have to acknowledge that after um, the collapse of feudalism, when people started to live in cities and in highly urbanized population where influx of industries and other factories and machineries help uh, mass produce production especially for for processed food that that gave 
Europeans um, a length of a food processing that helps them preserve and store foods in a longer time, help these places like cities and other urban areas um, generate more um, population. They have left the rural life where farming and agriculture was the, the major industries and came to the cities and other urban places to work with factories, right? So this is one of the major um, shifts when we talk about industrial transformation, which pushes people in, in, in gathering to one place that causes urbanization. That, you know, later on, um, built this very densely populated areas. Of course, there are um, repercussions of the increase of populations, but we have to talk about that later. But this time, again, transformation of urban environment, okay? The rise of inventions through science help factories generate more and more production that pushes people um, to, to be attracted in working to these industries, all right? Okay, now, urban populations grew faster than the general population primarily because of the vast migration from rural areas to the cities, just like what I said. People were driven from the countryside to the cities by sheer economic necessity, unemployment and hunger and physical want. Again, during the collapse of the feudalism, um, there were a lot of peasants working in, in the feudal land who were not really paid at all and just given just barely enough food um, to, to, to eat and to be shared by the family, right? And because of this, people who venture going to the city uh, was able to realize that there are um, enough opportunities for them to live and basically uh, get a better life than tilling the land of their feudal masters, okay? All right, so the social structure of mass society. So we've already known what happened in the transformation of the emergence of mass society. So basically, when people started um, developing their societies through industrialization, um, immigration from rural to urban started as well. And it causes um, um, mass, um, densely mass societies, right? So this is the structure of their society at that time. Now, historians generally agree that after 1871, the average person enjoyed an improving standard of living. The real wages of British workers, for example, probably doubled between 1871 to 1910. Can you imagine? Um, they were actually like slaves during the time when they worked as peasants of their feudal masters. They were just given barely enough of something to eat and enjoy generally in their lives. But during the time of industrialization where people needed to work in big factories and industries to produce more uh, processed foods and other processed products, um, well, at least the income or the wages has doubled since 1871 to 1910. So imagine its um, impact to the people who were working once in, in in the feudal state and then moving to the cities or to urban places and get good job and good life, right? Now, we should not allow the increase of standard of living to mislead us. So there's still something that we have to talk about, especially what are other social issues brought about by the, the emergence of mass society, right? It is true that they were paid at least not double from what they used to have during the time of their their work as you know peasants in the feudal states. However, again, uh, there are still repercussions of this, and let's talk about it. Now, great poverty did remain in Western society, and the gap between the rich and the poor was enormous. So can you imagine, again, equality of the distribution of the wealth of the nation was one of the leading factors why there are still great poverty Though it attracted more people to work in the society, what happened was the increase of um, the, the, the payment for your apartment or, or, or the place that you, uh, you're living in, in the urban places also, um, reached to, to double probably or to triple 
um, pace and other basic utilities that the people were enjoying at that time actually increased its prices. So basically, even if you are paid double at that time, but you're just merely a worker, you get a big chunk of your salary or your wage from the utilities that you are you are enjoying living in urban places. And even today, we are having that kind of problem, right? Yes, if you go to urban places, like if you want to go to Manila, to Cebu, you get to enjoy um, better wages because of their... Um, um, of, of, of the wages given to, to the cities, but yet you are also deemed to pay uh, more than what you are paying in the rural areas, especially for utilities. So again, it is not proportionate and it could cost you, again, another problem with your finances. Okay? Um, again, the gap between the rich and the poor continued. It's because um, Everything will be explained here when we talk about the elite. So again, the structure of the society in Europe remained. There are still rich and poor. But let's talk about who are the people interplaying in this discussion. All right, so we have the elites. Now, at the top of the European society stood a wealthy elite, constituting only 5% of the population by controlling between 30 to 40% of its wealth. This 19th century elite was an amalgamation of the traditional landed aristocracy that had dominated European society for centuries and the wealthy upper middle class. In the course of the 19th century, aristocrats coolies with the most successful industrialists, the bankers and merchants, to form a new elite. So basically, the feudal lords before just transformed their wealth um, and in and, and fit to what is happening to that society. In the 19th century, what they did, they just transformed their land, right? So they just shifted from being agricultural to industrial. Maybe they just leased their land for those industrialists who wanted to put big um, factories or industries, maybe banks, and that continued their wealth. Leaving again the peasants and other people who in the lower middle class or in lower class struggling to live a decent life okay in 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 parallel to the discussion of the elites in the philippines that is basically sounded the same here right so after the 1896 revolution i mean 1898 revolution um what happened was well the peasants still are the peasants and the elites the Filipino elites is the same thing, right? Up until today, those people who are um, um, considered to be as the elite in the Philippines are still the same names up until today, okay? They just transform their wealth from one to the other. And it's causing a lot of trouble when we talk about um, distribution of equality when we talk about wealth, okay? Okay, now the middle classes. Now the middle classes consisted of a variety of groups. Below, the upper middle class was a middle level that included such traditional groups as professionals in law, in medicine, the civil service, as well as a moderate well-to-do industrialist and merchants. Now the industrial expansion of the 19th century also added new groups to this segment of the middle class. These included business managers and new professionals, such as the engineers, architects, accountants, and chemists who formed professional associations as the symbol of their newfound importance. Now, a lower middle class of small shopkeepers, traders, manufacturers, and prosperous peasants provided goods and services for the classes above them. So again, the middle class is perfectly the same of what we have today. You know, people who have professional degrees that are um, earning um, as much as those who are in the, the lower middle and the lower class are the same professionals from before, right? And these are the classes that constitutes in the, the 19th century 
um, societies in Europe. Okay? The next is the lower class, of course. Now, the lower class of European society constituted almost 80% of the European population. 80%. Can you imagine? We have 4% elites and then about 16% um, of the middle class and 80% of the lower classes of the entire European populations. So imagine there are a lot of, of, of people working um, as um, peasants, as agricultural um, laborers, just laborers, um, share croppers, especially in Eastern Europe, right? Um, this was less true, however, in the Western and Central Europe because about 10% of the British population worked in agriculture. In Germany, the figure was 25%. Uh, many prosperous land-owning peasants shared the values of uh, the middle class. So again, at least there's about a difference between um, Europeans when we talk about uh, inequality of the dis distribution of wealth. Um, military conscription brought peasants into contact with other groups of mass society and state-run elementary schools forced the children of peasants to speak the national dialect and accept national um, loyalties. Now, um, imagine this is also the time where intellectuals you now tries to, to, to deliberate what's happening in their society. Um, in this time, well, we already know about Karl Marx and it's, 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 it's a vigor about communism uh, together with, with Engels and other um, philosophers and, and, and sociologists who try to, to provide us what's happening in their societies. Because basically, um, they have shown great interest in being freed from the conventional um, political powers that they have before, like the monarchs, but they just distributed their, their power um, as such that still they are oppressed in their societies, right? It didn't have much, you know, difference and impact after gaining independence from their monarchy. Um, they have built their own government system that, that represents the majority of the people, but yet in, in income distribution or wealth distribution, we'll be able to see the classes who are ruling their um, economic prosperity, leaving behind, well, 80% of the entire European population remain um, living in, in a very poor condition, right? Okay. Now, after knowing about the classes that they have in, in the society of Europe at that time, let's talk about the role of women during the time. Now, the woman question was the term used to refer to the debate over the role of women in society. In 19th century, women remained legally inferior, economically dependent, and largely defined by family and household roles. Many women still aspired to the ideal of femininity popularized by writers and poets. So, well, even in 19th century Europe, women are still considered to be a second-class citizen. And you can get a lot of references how women being portrayed in the fantasies of men, right? That they are just second, um, secondary, um, you know, citizen of the society, that their decision matters if it is approved by the men in the household. But, of course, it shifted during... Um, the course of the 19th century. Now, historians have pointed out that this traditional characterization of the sexes based on gender-defined social roles was virtually elevated to the status of a universal male and female attributes in the 19th century, largely due to the impact of industrial revolution on the family. Yes, if you can see, during the feudal system at least, both men and women are actually working in the same manner of, of the feudal state or the feudal land, right? But during the time of industrial revolution, there were segregation 
between the roles of males and females um, lending a job inside a factory, okay? Well, of course, males use, um, usually get higher pays or higher wages than the females, right? And work, because the, the basis is the, the, the defined social roles that the society has created. Basically, well, European society thought that male does or do hard labor than a female. That's why they are paid, um, well, differently. Male gets to have at least higher wages than a female. Up until today, that still is one of the many reasons that some uh, women were not uh, or are not getting um, promotions like men because we are what well, the society you know, tries to portray uh, women role as women. Um, women who does um, domestic household roles than uh, males who actually do laborers outside the household. Right? Up until today, we still have that kind of issues. Okay. All right. Now, next, um, as the chief family wage earners, men work. This is what I said. Men work outside the home while women were left with the care of the family to which they were paid nothing. Okay. Um, you've heard a lot of stories no, from maybe your parents to your grandparents and to their parents' parents that basically, you know, the Philippine society has this um, virtually uh, male dominated society, right? And, and, and usually uh, females are left just to take care of, of the business inside the house, the being paid, okay? And that's one thing that we have to acknowledge and consider, especially for you social science um, students, no? Uh, one day you'll become a, a teacher and you have to make sure that equality in teaching um, social structures in our society is given emphasis, especially on the roles of men, women, and LGBTQ+, and other gender roles that was um, assigned to us should be given emphasis of an equal footing, right? Because not everything that men do is basically just relative for them because men, I mean, women and LGBTQ plus can actually do the same thing, right? Okay. Um, of course, the ideal did not always match reality, um, especially for the lower classes where the needed for supplemental income drove women to do sweet, um, sweated work, you know? Sweated work, I'm sorry, sweated work. All right, so um, again, you've had a glimpse of what was the role of women in that society and its transformation to the age of feminism, which up until today, um, it's one of the biggest issues that we are you know, trying to, to give an emphasis on our discussions that everybody should have an equal footing to everything that we wanted to pursue in life, right? All right, so next we have education and leisure in the age of mass society. So what are the things that emerge during the age of mass society? Of course, mass education was introduced as a product of mass society of the late 19th century. Being educated in the early 19th century meant attending a secondary school or possibly even a university. Because at that time, prior to industrialization, of course, prior to this, um, in a feudal society or even in ancient society, those who can actually be educated are those people who belong to the noble class, who belong to the upper class, who belong to the classes where um, essential wealth are needed for you to attend to. Okay, so if you are you belong to the lower class of the society, basically you won't be able to get you know the education that the others are enjoying, but in the pursuit of of educating one another in the 19th century well secondary schools were introduced and possibly you as a, a middle class or lower middle class or the lower class could possibly even enter the university as long as provided um, that you can um, be useful of uh, 
what the curriculum mandates in that particular school. Okay. Now, secondary school was a primarily for the daily, but it expanded to the middle class and even though, and even in the lower class. Okay. So again, primarily for the elite. Okay. Now, mass leisure in the pre-industrial uh, centuries prior to industrialism or industrialization, uh, play or leisure activities had been closely connected to work patterns based on seasonal or daily cycles, uh, cycles typical of the life of the peasants and artisans. The process of industrialization in the 19th century had an enormous impact upon those traditional patterns. Say, for example, um, in the feudal society, you know, their, their work, their play, and their leisure time actually revolves in, in one setup. Um, if you have noticed, leisure during the, the siesta time of the Filipino farmers, usually buktungan or folk um, songs or folk tales or stories, these are actually connected to the work that they have. Try to, to decipher or to discern the content of the buktungan, the content of of the folk tales, the content of, of of the song that they are singing, you will be able to notice that it involves everything in agriculture or farm life, right? Or beyond that, it involves to household in anything that 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 involves their daily routine or their daily work. Same with what's happening in Europe at that time, okay? But in industrial revolution, of course, it shifted um, the factory because the factory imposed new work patterns that were determined by the rhythms of the machines and the clocks. So for prior to this, what they have are rhythms of the wind blowing the trees, um, you know, the farm crops and all, um, the songs of the birds or the chirping of the birds and so on and so forth. But it shifted during the industrial revolution because the sounds and the patterns of work shifted as well, right? From land to machine, so that's what they have, all right? And remove work time completely from the family environment of farms and workshops. Um, that's why during the, the introduction of Industrial Revolution, um, this also shifted the people from being, uh, well, the European people from being collectivist to individualist, thanks to the, the introduction of industrial revolution and its effects to the people. All right, so work and leisure became opposites as leisure came to be viewed as what people do for fun after work. In fact, the new leisures, uh, leisure hours created by the industrial system, evening hours after work, weekends, and later a week or two in the summer, largely determined the contours of the new mass leisure. See, so prior to industrial revolution, work and play goes around, right? I mean, not goes around, but they, they, they interplay to one another. But in, in, in the industrial revolution, <clears throat> it actually gave a, a time for work and a time for leisure. Up until today, we can only enjoy, right? Our leisure time right after work and enjoy it much after five days of work, no, during weekends. That's the only time that we could enjoy possibly our lives after the stressful days of work, right? So that was the beginning of the, the changes of work and leisure during the emergence of mass society. Now talking about national state, so let's talk about the national state. This would be the last um, discussion this is actually a transformation from feudal society after revolution to revolution you know, to civil wars and gaining independence from their monarch or even not getting independence by their monarch but being able to get an equal representation in their government using a parliamentary form of government was introduced. Um, this are the, the timeline, all right? Now, pre-1500s, most people live in small villages paid tithes to feed the landlords, didn't travel, and cared little for anything beyond the village. That's pre-1500s. And since this is the time of the Middle Ages, 
most of the influences of their society comes from the church and the crown, right? But in 14, uh, 1485, the 1500s and onwards, Henry VII wins the War of the Roses, this is between the Lancaster and the Yorks, in England, and begins a Tudor dynasty that starts the development of the English nation state. So what happened is it gave a representation for the people to, to sit in the office and represent the masses, right? So it shifted from the entire autocratic um, system of, of governance to a more uh, democratic way where um, the, the, the power of the state is not solely coming from the crown anymore or the monarchy, but it is distributed to uh, the representation of the masses, which is actually good, right? In 1492, Spanish monarchs Ferdinand and Isabella finished taking back all of the Spain from the Muslims. The era of Spain as a global power begins. So this was the time where um, city-states of Spain was distributed uh, unevenly because they were once a colony of a Muslim um, empire. But later, when they gained independence, they took over their independent city states and called it again back to Spain. And this started, though it's under monarchy, but this started um, a nation state of a Spanish state. All right. And you, were be, uh, you would be uh, noticing this. From all of the conquests from you know 1500s onwards um, after the the fall of the Spanish um, Empire well everything that they do is actually in honor of Spain and that is a sense of nationalism right because they, the the emergence of national state in Spain is so um, powerful all right, next, in 1547 to 1584, Ivan the Terrible rules Russia. He unifies the government and creates the first Russian nation state. 1638 to 1715, Louis XIV of France creates an absolute monarchy. France emerges as a dominant power in Europe. In 1648, we have peace, sorry, we have peace of Westphalia cements the legal status of the nation as a state sovereign. 1789, the French Revolution, it creates modern French nation um, state and sparks nationalism around the world. All right, so um, the French Revolution started, of course, the creation of the parliament of, of the French or the democratic government of the French but also you know what napoleon bonaparte's role in 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 making you know france as an empire under his you know napoleon's um rule also gave under another nation nation states i mean another country to develop na na national states it's because of the tyranny brought by napoleon's um, power other um countries that they they occupied and ruled over actually gained momentum and then started to develop um, a sense of nationalism and starting to drive away the force of Napoleon, right? But also Napoleon Bonaparte is quite a unique imperialist, right? He's autocratic, but he is also, um, um, you know, an idealist of or a fan of of democracy because yeah, he wanted to represent the people he doesn't want to have an absolute autocratic rule but he have or he had given um, opportunities to other people to actually rule their country and that also gave an idea to 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 to, to, to the the countries occupied by the Poland at that time okay 1871 unification of italy and germany is complete and the Treaty of Versailles after World War I um, was cemented in 1919. Um, and then in 1945, the United Nations was. So these are some of the most important events in the history of the establishment of the national state. 
if you wanted to more and get more details about this, just try to go over and search for these important events. You'll get a lot, a lot of, of information and readings for um, this one. Okay. Now, talking about imperialism, again, uh, what brought imperialism and colonialism uh, from the Western imperialists is because of their move to find um, and look for another land where they can get resources. Okay, so the time that they have explored the seas was at the mark of imperialism and colonialism, most especially to um, Asia and America. Right, so that's the end of our an, one hour discussion for the emergence of society, mass society, I'm sorry. Um, let me end my sharing. And then uh, just like from other discussions, if you have questions, just don't forget to write it down below to our comment box or comment section. And I'll answer you whenever I can, as soon as possible, okay? All right, so that will be the end of our World History 2 discussion. Don't forget, we'll meet on Monday and Tuesday for the next online sync and hope to talk to you soon. Okay, if there's no interruptions, then I'll be able to meet you. Don't forget, you still have due activities and outputs from your module, so deadline would be next week, March 1st week. Um, your module 7 will be uploaded if not this weekends i think it probably on next week weekdays okay all right so i'll see you soon goodbye i'm in bssc too